So, good afternoon. I'm Alejandro Costa. I am a member of LACNIC staff, and specifically at the research and development section, I will be supporting the real experts on IPv6 in our lab. This lab is IPv6, and and there's another parallel on secure routing, and now we're going to present the speakers for today's session, ask questions. The intention is to learn. So today we're going to speak moving into the future, building an IPv6 only network. We think that IPv6 only networks will be the future. And many countries, this is already the present time, but increasingly this will be part of our reality. With us, we have Eduardo Barazal, who works at his coordinator of the training and autonomous systems area, etc. NIC.br. Then from NIC.br. We have uh, Lucas Jorge Wanderson Modesto, Tiago Nakamura, and Antonio Marcos Moreiras. So the topics we'll be discussing today are very important. For many years, we have been working on this topic, focusing on IPv6 only networks. And today, <coughs> we'll be having a look at the demos. You will all be participating. We always organize demos. Beyond the PowerPoint presentations and so on, the idea is that you can work. We have labs. We'll be working with Joule, NAT64, and a topic that we haven't discussed at in previous events is that we're going to have proxies. So the people who were in the previous two webinars, these were in preparation for today's activity. So we'll have proxies. We'll be having an IPv6 only network and the proxy that will be an IPv4 and IPv6 that will be dual stack. So we will be able to access that content from any type of address family and a large number of servers that will be in IPv6. So I'll give the floor to Wanderson, who will be starting. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I, I am Wanderson, and I'm going to speak in Portuguese. So, as I was saying, um, Wanderson, I will speak in Portuguese, not in Spanish. So this afternoon, we'll be giving a tutorial that we call Path to the Future IPv6 Only Networks. So we're going to speak about the transition to IPv6. Like Alejandro was saying, we organized two webinars in preparation for this tutorial. These are the links, if you wish to check this out. Not now. Now you have to pay attention to what we're going to do today. But these are the links of these two webinars. They're in, they are in LACNIC's YouTube site. We're going to explain first how to configure Linux server with IPv6 only, and then a webinar organized by Lucas and Tiago. And we also showed how to configure machines and servers for IPv6 only in network interfaces. A second webinar was organized to speak about the path towards IPv6 only networks. Now, before embarking on this tutorial, on IPv6 only networks. Let us briefly review IPv6. This will be very rapidly so that we really start to go into this topic. So let us first look at the addressing. 
As you can see, this is an IPv6 address. IPv6 addresses are different compared to IPv4 addresses. So the first change is that it is longer. These are eight fields, not just the IPv4 fields, but there are eight different fields, which are all separated by a colon. We're going to have 2001, 0db8, AD1F, colon, and so on, as you can see up here on the slide. And each field of IPv6 is composed of four hexadecimal characters, numbers or letters. We're going to use then these algorithms in hexadecimals, which is a change compared to IPv4, where we had notation from 0 to 255. Here in IPv6, we have algorithms that start from 0 and go through to F. So this gives us 16 possibilities of having fields that change. Now, what sometimes is confusing is that each of these characters, each hexadecimal algorithm is composed of four bits of the binary system. So we could have four bits, and each character is composed of four bits. We have a field with four bits. Four times four is 16. So we have a block of 16 bits. So we have eight blocks of 16 bits. So this adds up to 128 bits. <coughs> so we have many more bits compared to IPv4, where we had 32. Here we're working with 128 bits for the purpose of addressing. So we have quite a bit more. So what else can I say? Well, when we, when we look at the binary system, which is sometimes confusing and people are somehow fearful of, is that we have to recall that the binary system, when we go from hexadecimal or from decimal, each of these fields is equivalent to a different value. So we have to be careful with that. Each field is equivalent to a different value. This is a mathematical concept, two to the two one first, two to the first zero. Here in this slide, we see 2001. So two in hexadecimal, and we transform this into the binaries. So we have position one, position two, position three, position four. And then depending on the position of the bit that is on or off, I mean, on is with one and off is with zero. So depending on the position, we have different values that go from zero to F. And this is what we can vary there. Now, one of the things that we say normally here is that a lot is said about IPv6, that this is a protocol of the future. Now, when is that future? Is it the future now? So we really have to change that mindset. IPv6 is no longer the protocol of the future. It's a protocol of the present. And IPv4 is a legacy protocol. So the IPv4 protocol has to be stopped use until we have IPv6 only networks, which is the topic of today's tutorial. So it's not no longer the protocol of the future. IPv4 is a legacy protocol, but IPv6 is the protocol we have now. And this year that LACNIC has come to Brazil, we are celebrating the 25th anniversary of IPv6. And it is no longer new, but we're still calling it and describing it as a protocol of the future. But it has been in process for 25 years now. At NICVR, we have been working already for the past 15 years. We have been speaking about the IPv6 initiative, so 25 years of the IPv6 protocol and 15 years of NICPR's IPv6 protocol. NICPR has been organizing courses and activities. We have been speaking to the 
equipment vendors. <coughs> so IPv6 will no longer be that feared monster, that enormous number which everyone is so afraid of. So we will see in our laboratories today that you will use to practice hands-on so we can step by step demonstrate what we did earlier today with our PKI. So in other words, you will have a specific laboratory so that you can follow these step by step. So here in IPv6, we're going to have this representation that we're going to divide into in the network. We're not going to have the subnetwork mask. We forget the concept of the masks and the first bits are what we call network prefixes. This is the part that corresponds to the network, and the remaining 64 bits are those that identify the interface. So we change the names the way we speak. We will no longer speak about sub-network mass. We're going to speak about prefixes. We're going to have a slash 32, a slash 48, a slash 56, a slash 64. So that is the way in which we are going to describe the things in IPv6. Now, let us have a look at some of these formats. You will see that we have a relatively long address. And we're not only going to use numbers as with IPv4, but we'll have letters. So it's going to be a hexadecimal notation, A, B, C, D, E, and F. And when representing the address, we can use these in uppercase or in lowercase. This does not matter because this is about the way we represent these, how we represent that address. Now, the interesting thing about this is that if we're going to represent things with uppercase, is that we are consistent not to mix up uppercase and lowercase letters because this might lead to confusion because we don't really know if that is uh, 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 relevant because we normally decide to be consistent. I'm going to do IPv6 only using uppercase or only using lowercase. There are some cases in IPv6 when the address is so long that we can shorten the address. For example, zeros on the right can be abbreviated. For example, 2001 colon 0 db8. That zero we see in the notation can then be abbreviated. We could put 2001 colon db8. So we can shorten that address. We have two or more fields that only have zeros, so we can remove those with colon, colon. So in that way, we have a address that looks shorter, and we no, don't need to notate the entire address. We can abbreviate the address, and this makes things simpler when working with addresses like these. So now we have that major discussion and difficulty of working both with IP4 and IPv6. This has to do with compatibility with the, the two protocols. If we compare the two protocols, if we look at the two, an IPv4 machine can only speak directly with another IPv4 machine. A machine that speaks IPv6 can only speak with another machine that speaks IPv6 only. So I cannot communicate from one device to another if one is IPv4 and one is IPv6 because the two speak different languages. So what we need is to have something that allows them to speak, to interact. We need something in the middle, like kind of translator, in order to translate the two different languages. So we also, or we need machines 
that speak both languages fluently. So this is what we call dual stack. We have IPv4 and IPv6 simultaneously, so we'll have a bilingual machine. So if we compare the two protocols, IPv4 with 32 bits and IPv6 with 128 bits, and we look at them in IPv4, we'll have four blocks which we called octets. They are separated by a dot. In the case of IPv6, we have eight blocks, which we call hexadecatets, but they are separated by colons. So you can see that the notation of an address changes. Now, if we compare the two protocols, if we are now speaking about the header, and going into the technical part, what can we see when comparing the two protocols? We see that some of the fields of these protocols were maintained. The ones of IPv4 were maintained in IPv6. Some of the fields were removed. So this was removed from IPv4's headers. We don't need it for IPv, the IPv6 header. And there are some other fields that are, were changed. And then there was another field that was added. This shows us once again that two different protocols with different headers, in other words, machines that speak only IPv4, they only speak with IPv4 machines. And those who speak IPv6 speak only with those that are IPv6. So we need to have a mechanism whereby the machine can deal with the two protocols or if we have a translation mechanism. So we identify a way in whereby we have IPv6 only networks, but we need to have the possibility of that IPv6 network can speak with a legacy IPv4 network. So we need to have something from the outer world, so to speak. So we need to have something that can serve as an intermediary to enable this conversation. So these are, you will have the two networks, the network in IPv6 on IPv6, and we will then see what we have to do to make it possible for IPv6 only networks speak with the legacy IPv4 networks. So how how can we have an IPv6 only network? We're going to start uh, talking about uh, some techniques that uh, will be approached during our tutorial. And I'm going to invite Eduardo to come and talk with us. And he's going to tell you a bit what the techniques are and how they're going to be used. So, as Anderson just said, I'm, go I'm Eduardo Vas Morales. I'm going to tell you how to have an IPv6 only network. Before doing that, I wanted to show you some slides that Anderson already told you about. They are a visual aid so that we may understand that an IPv6 uh, only only a machine cannot uh, work with uh, an IPv4. So let us talk about translation techniques. And when we look at the two headers, we are going to see that there's a loss of information because one has some things that the other one doesn't. So you have to create things when you go from one world to the other, and they are different. So now let's talk about the paths that use a certain transition techniques, but always trying to reach a world where every, everything is IPv6, because that's the final solution. In any transition technique, we lose information. So in the, the first step would be the current uh, stage. Most institutions are there. It's uh, starting to work in dual stack. 
PV6 native plus PV4 shared or native shared if we have a few IPv4s or shared or if you have many you can use the native with all the public addresses that are IPv4 so much the better now what would be the second and third steps like we want to move in that direction IPv6 only networks we have to start removing IPv4 from our network and the best way we can do that is using transition technique we start by removing IPv4 addresses from different machines and we accumulate them in just one single machine when we reach the third state step we turn off the machine so the network continues to work well it doesn't touch the IPv6 part and we start uh, phasing out IPv4 little by little so let's talk about transition techniques such as NAT64 plus DNS64 and SIT and SITDC and also proxy reverse we gradually remove IPv4 from our network we put those uh, addresses in our machine for a proxy our query and we leave everything in our network of in IPv6 only before we reach the third uh, step where we'll will disactivate IPv4 completely so if you uh, inactivate the machine then you made it it's very easy now the second step native IPv6 in all the network we see that this is very interesting we started to worry as network administrators and working with one single protocol and that reduces our headache. So people joke because they say that we work with two protocols, but we receive one one uh, uh, salary. So we have twice the work. And we're all trying to work with one single protocol and to leave some special machines to work with IPv4. Now, if we think that the internet is migrating to the IPv6 world, the communication with IPv6 will flow. And the machines that need to communicate with IPv6 IPv4 will go to an additional machine that, for instance, NAT64 uh, uh, to for a uh, transition to the IPv4 world. Now, if the destination is in IPv6, we will send normal IPv6. But if it goes to IPv4, we have to. It has to go through the translating machine. The same thing with the loss of the uh, headings, headers. So as uh, the machine is. Uh, um, if you stop using the machine, it will be useless and it and we'll be able to uh, inactivate it. That's the easiest path. If we uh, if we don't think of an easy uh, path, it's going to every, uh, it's going to be much more difficult. The world is going to become IPv6 only, and at some time we'll have to uh, uh, implement IPv6 uh, very very quickly. We'll have to uh, delete IPv4. All of a sudden, it won't be easy. So we have to work step by step. So little by little, IPv4 in that second step we are going to consider it uh, as uh, IPv4 as a service um, IPv4 as a service we leave just a few IPv4 addresses in the machine they are going to go through a transition or transition techniques or proxies so here you have we'll show scenarios of as if it were a data center it's different from what we said in the webinar where we gave examples of providers here we think of data centers let's imagine that in our data center we have most of our service operating in ipv6 if any of my services needs to communicate with the world out there you, we can use the nat64 technique to work with the ipv4 world out there so we are working for that purpose with uh, the outbound connections not in ipv4 also brings problems in the incoming uh, uh, addresses and uh, so in uh, there we have it in uh, IPv4 to, um, so we would uh, to talk with the IPv4 world we would use IPv4 if somebody wants uh, to um, use our um, 
here we have the sit uh, uh, they see that it's a one-to-one -one, uh, mapping or a reverse proxy here this uh, here we look for information for ipv6 information it reaches the reverse proxy and it uh, gives a response to ipv4 and here we have the solutions to provide uh, connectivity to ipv4 world so um, and with an IPv6 user, the access is direct. Um, uh, in the IPv6 network, we already work in the board of IPv4. Um, that is why. So, and, and that is why we are thinking of uh, uh, putting off. Uh, uh, doing without IPv4 at some time. So that is the idea that we have today to uh, reach a moment of IPv6 only. Thinking of uh, IPv4 and our outbound connections that is defined in RF66146, this is a stateful translation with a state uh, storage. The packages are there being stored. What will be the destinations that will be IPv4 and what will be IPv6 for to do the translation? And we're going to see how the uh, uh, technique works. But that uh, must have a storage uh, a record to show that the information was uh, 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 so, and there we have the outbound uh, uh, information. Our network will work with IPv6 and wants to talk with IPv4 using the translator. So now it can use the prefix 64 ff 9 b 96 but it also has limitations. Some machines are not prepared to work with IPv6, some software, sorry. So if we want to leave everything in IPv6 only, but there's some software that needs an IPv4 and under some old uh, app, uh, the DNS, uh, or that have the address uh, that is giving problems in the code, well, it might not work. Here, we have to solve some problems. So the transition techniques are not perfect. That is why there are so many. We need to use a set of them. But uh, they're going to help us reach the IPv6 only world. So. Speaking of NAT64, it's going to be easier when we find when we show you the flowchart. Here we have a DNS64. This operates as a recursive DNS. It's easier for providers because imagine that the destination that you want to have access in the IPv4, but you only have a um, IPv6, and the DNS says there is no response um, for, for A, and only it's if the machine has IPv6 only, you they, it won't be able to have a conversation because there's nothing to answer in the other side. We have to use NAT64. So BIND is already working for those who want to implement it. And we are going to focus now in NAT64, that is the translating machine we want to work with. And that is the one more difficult to configure, an example of how it can work. We have the IPv6 world, and it wants to talk to the IPv4 world. And as it's a, a normal client, um, it's um, it's going through the internet. Um, and uh, uh, now we have IPv6 uh, to that uh, number only. So, uh, uh, let's see, example.com, DNS64. Um, 
So here it will look for the quad A register of the domain of the example.com. So it's going to say it doesn't exist. But if my client wants to access something that doesn't exist, uh, how come? It's going to wonder. So maybe what it wants to have access to is an IPv4. Let's see if there's an A registry. So it asks uh, the authority of the DNS, and uh, the answer is yes, it exists. Here you have the IPv4 address. But our customer in its machine has IPv6 only. So what do they have to do? Well, you have to sort of uh, deceit. You have to uh, cheat in the machine so that it will believe that it will be in IPv6 machine. So you put the prefix 64FF9B, and we put the IPv4 address inside the IPv6 address. Now, when Anderson showed this, uh, he showed this as one of the valid formats. But when we see a sniffer or a log, uh, you are going to see that IPv4 address um, th and that uh, goes to hexadecimals. We are going to see everything as hexadecimals. So, and uh, so with the IPv6 address, uh, we go to the machine, not 64, where that will translate it. So, notice. The one it shows to destination, um, NAT64 reaches there, it removes uh, the IP4 destination there and must put uh, an address uh, of origin. And then you have the stateful. Uh, uh, um, of the uh, so it will choose one address and we put together the IPv4 packet. It would uh, talk with uh, and uh, with the IPv4 and it will have a response. But uh, it will have to see what IPv4 will uh, it was assigned for IPv6 so that it can talk with the client. Now in the translation where you have loss of information, but in many cases it works, thinking that the world is already migra migrating into what IPv6 is close to 50%, 45% usage. So therefore, very soon we will go from 60 uh, percent, and uh, these machines are going to be used less and less in the future. And now, in the uh, lab of IP, in, in the lab of IPv4, we'll do a uh, NAT64 with Joule. So I'm going to give the floor to Lucas, who will share his screen and give you all the explanations, as we did this morning. If you want to uh, do the lab with us, raise your hands. Our team will go around and we're going to assign the addresses so that you can do the lab in your own machines. So then we are going to learn how to configure NAT64 in your machines. Another interesting thing is to show where the material is. It's in our site. That is the same that was presented this morning. That's class uh, salon de classe dot nic dot br. So we are waiting until they share the screen to give the floor. Well, there you enter that site. You can follow it step by step. And Lucas will show you. If you don't manage to do it in your computer, you can see the presentation here. And even those uh, who are virtually, you can uh, uh, go to the tutorial with Lucas or those here in the room. And if you want to participate, Tiago and I, we're going to circulate to help you with your joint uh, experiences. We, we don't see that Lucas' uh, screen is being shared. So just a minute, we're, going to, we're about to share the screen and we're going to be able to do the lab all together. So you're going to be able to do it with us. If you, so if you wish, 
you can access a classroom uh, dot nick dot, uh, VR, where it's where you have all the material to go step by step. We are speaking Portuguese, the materials in Portuguese, but when Lucas has the tutorial, he's going to translate what is written and you can follow what the commands are marking for the presentation. So when we fix this, raise your hands, please, so we can give you your groups and we save time. So let us, let us resume. I work with Tiago and Eduardo and with Wanderson. We prepared this tutorial for you on NAT64. Eduardo and Tiago are already working on this. If you wish to have the PDF that describes this, you can access here in sala de aula dot nick dot pr. Here we divided the course into two parts. One is LATNIC 40 tutorial. There you have all the tutorial. You have the morning session, the one on Krill, and at the bottom you have this tutorial on NAT64 stateful. This is a PDF file containing all the description, explanation, as well as all the commands that we'll be using. Now, before speaking about this topology, Joule is an open source software. It was created by Nick Mexico. It is used to work both in the transition for 
not 6-4, and for SIT, which is an extra tutorial. So this is a topology that we prepared as follows. We have a central server where we're going to install Joule. We have three IPv6 clients and three IPv4 clients. The idea is to make those IPv6 clients communicate with the IPv4 client. So we just set this up in Joule in the Demian, and we're going to install it. Like we explained, it's going to be stateful. So it's going to store the session information, it's going to store the logs, and we're going to explain how this is going to work. So once you logged in to our site, then you will be able to look at the topology. Here we have internet. He apologizes. So I'm going to write here so that you can access. I forgot to enter the link to include the link in the PDF file. So I'm going to write this out over here. So https lab hyphen curso dot septro dot br lab hyphen So HTTPS lab hyphen curso dot septro dot br. So you have it there on the screen. So when you enter that link, I will exit this site so we can do the entire path together. So we'll have the login screen the sign-in screen, you're going to put lab nick and the number you received. I'm going to use 90 as an example. So mine is lacknick 90 and the password is going to be lac lab grupo 90. So here you can use native console and HTML5 console. I recommend using HTML5 console because this works with software that has to be installed in the computer for a terminal. So if you work with it, you might not have it. So some of the things of the lab might not work. So what I recommend is to use HTML5. So you can use the lab. I'm going to use the native one because I already have the software. This is the topology with my IPv4 and IPv6 clients. We're going to configure this so that they can communicate using Joule. In our PDF, we have the list of software used. Joule, we're going to use the latest version, which is 4.1.10. Our server is a Debian 12. It's late, the latest version. And the clients have Linux. Alpine 3.7, 17, which is very lightweight. All clients and the server will use the credentials you have in the PDF. The user is root and the password is tor, which is root, in the, right, written the other way around. So the first part is to configure the network in our server. So we'll go back to the signing part. So somehow I logged out. Remember not to use the number 90 because that's mine. So you're going to open this part with the topology 
click in the central server. This is a screen where you log in with the user root and the password tour. And then you're going to configure the network on that server. So those who already participated in the network on IPv6 only networks already know this, but we're going to edit this file, this file interfaces. You can use any type of editor. You didn't use mine. So I'm going to enter here nano. I'm going to enter nano. Slash networking interfaces, which is a configuration file that we have in the Debian. So it already has things that have been set up, but we are going to delete the lower part of the interface, ENP03. We're going to use a Static IPv6. We're going to enter three IPv4 addresses. So here in the interface in IPv4, we're going to enter three IPv4 addresses because we're going to have an IPv4 address pool. Like Eduardo said, we're going to do that translation using a small amount of IPv4s. We're going to put IPv3. We're going to put three clients now in IPv4, but if you have a lot, you can have three IPv4 addresses and Jules will say, well, they're going to use what it's going to need in order to do what you're asking it for. So I'm going to remove this text over here and I'm going to put auto by default. It comes from DHCP, but I'm going to put static. Let us zoom in so we can increase the font size. So if it were my computer, it would be simpler. So this is better for us short-sighted, who are short-sighted. So let's see if I can adjust the screen a bit. So maybe you can view this better now. What we're going to do now is to enter the IPv6 address of this interface. And let us not forget to correct this and put this for IPv6. Here I zoomed in, but it looks a bit strange somehow. Just a minute, something happened over here in this terminal. I'm sorry. So let us uh, start again. Let's reopen it. So the problem is to see what I'm writing. So let us restart the server.
So let me check. I'm, I'll go back to the configuration file. I can't find it. It's 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 not working. I can't leave. I can't get out. Let's change the machine. It, it, this is just to explain that in this computer it's not working, so I'm going to change my laptop and now I'm going to use Sanderson's. It's, it's what happened when we are working live.
So now we can go on. I think that now, back to normal. Let's recap. Is it very, can you see well? Or is it very difficult to see? So now with the magnifying glass, we can increase it. So I had, I'm going to where I had stopped, that is a configuration of the network. I'm going to enter the network interfaces again. I won't uh, enter everything because we would be wasting too much time, a time we do not have. But I'm going to copy this from the PDF. So let's delete here the existing configurations and let's add the ones we need for dual. So I need the static uh, IPv6 address in one of the interfaces. I also need the IPv4 addresses and a DDHCP address that I'm going to use uh, to connect uh, uh, to uh, the uh, lab. So I'm going to take these addresses from the PDF and I'm going to paste them here in my document. I'm afraid I'm going to have to enter them by hand. So, here we put uh, the network configurations, we uh, put it away, control, to save it it's control A and uh, to remove it it's control X to go leave nano and we are going to apply the network configurations here using the system they start working and we are going to restart here with the command 
system CTL restart network. Net restart networking. Here, it applied uh, the, the data correctly. We're going to use uh, the IP uh, ADDR show to check if the uh, network uh, uh, data was applied correctly. And here we have the IPv4 address. Actually, it's three addresses. We have um, uh, to uh, do the internet connection. And we have the IPv6 uh, address that will do the translation to check whether the internet is working. We are going to ping here in Google. See for google.com and we see that we can successfully connect to the internet. Now we need to uh, activate uh, the packets so that they can be forwarded. So we can activate and uh, we might have to restart, or I can show you how this is done so it won't get loose configuration. So we see the the faces of IPv4 and IPv6 for a forwarding also here. So, the customers have already been configured, so we won't have to add any IPv6 addresses in these computers to install Joule. The first thing we need to do is to check that the header, the most recent header, is the one that uh, we are using. So, we use uh, AVD updates to take the most uh, recent packets. So this is the command apt install header, and with that variable, it will take the most recent ones from the channel we're using. Install Linux headers. So while well, this gets updated, the next step, I'm going to ask you to access temp, which is a temporary file directory. And this is because the in the test we did, if you try to install this in a directory where APT does not have authorization, you'll have an error in the authorization, and it won't install some of the Joule things. So we're going to download the packets in that temporary file. And because we have problem with the authorizations, it will be installed properly. So we're going to enter here the temp directory. And then we're going to download Joule directly in this directory. This command over here is one single line. It's a W get from Jewel. So it's going to get the Jewel from Chemist and the Jewel tools. So we're going to write this in one single line. If you can copy and paste in the terminal, that's better. I'm going to change terminals here because I cannot copy and paste. So I'm going to use HTML5. This is how I had recommended to do. So I'll Enter once again. Okay, forgot to change it.
So even like that, I am unable to paste it. So I won't enter all that command. So we have an option to install tool. The way I showed you about is pasting packets in 4.1.10 is about recent one. But if you use the apt install tool, then you get a previous version. Now, this is because when you launch this once again, it does all the checking before putting it in the repository, in the stable repository. The last time we checked this was on September the 12th, and it hadn't been updated. So I'm going to install it in this way using the apt install. This won't make any difference to the configuration. So I made a mistake with the packet name. So we're going to start the process. We can put yes in the confirmation. However, it will reach a stage when it's at 96%, it takes some time to process the information once it reaches that point. So let us wait until fin it finishes. So now it installed Joule, and to verify if it is properly installed, we can enable the Joule command, and it will show the two modes, the normal one and the SIT. So this is a NAT64, and the SIT will be used in the next tutorial. So now let us go on to the configuration part. First of all, we have to enable the dual mode. So let us use the mod probe command. We enable the mode. And the next step is to create a dual instance and pass the IPv6 pool that will be used. So we're going to use 
64FF90 specified here in the RFC. So once you do the IPv6 translation to IPv4, it's going to insert this in the IPv6 address. Tool also allows you to work with IP tables. It uses a net filter by default, but if you wish to change to IP tables, you can you have this option too. So let us put Joule instance to add the instance. This is the instance. If you don't specify anything, it uses the one that is there by default. We created one that is called LACNIC40 and the IPv6 pool. I'm going to copy all this. I'm going to copy this here in the jewel. To check this instance, if it was properly created, you can put the com jewel command, instance display, and it shows namespace. And if we have two instances with the same name, you cannot distinguish. You can distinguish this with a namespace. You have the name and the framework, which is net filter in this case. So we can now test connectivity. We had to install the tool. We created an instance, and automatically, it can establish communication. Now, what test are we going to do then? We go back to the topology. I'm going to take this client over here, this IPv6 client, which ends in 8. It's 2001 DB8. So I'm going to ping a client, an IPv4 client, on the other side. So how do I do this? Over here, I enter my IPv6 address the one I use for the translation, and the IPv4 address that I want to have as destination. And because my client already has been configured, let me show you over here. If we use the IP ADD, it is already configured with the IP address, IPv6 address. And using my Joule server as a gateway. When I tried to do ping to that IP address, when I tried to do so, it will send this to my Joule address packet. It's going to make sure that it is this address over here and automatically the one that is highlighted and automatically do the translation. So let us ping and check in the jewel to see how this, what this looks like in the jewel. 6.4 FF. Nine B and it, over here, we enter the IPv6 address that I want to have as destination. It's 203.0.113.08. Sorry, 1138, sorry. So I entered my address from my IPv6 pool plus the IPv4 address of destination. So I'm going to allow the ping to act. You can see it is working. It receives responses and our Joule server We'll then use this command over here in our PDF. It is Joule minus I to specify in what Joule instance I want to display this. And I want to use the ICMP protocol. Now, what are the ICMP sessions that are active in the Joule? I go over to my Joule. I'm going to use this command over here. I'm going to leave my customer doing ping, and you will note that it shows me that I have a session that expires in one minute if there is no interaction. So this is a connection with a remote IP, which is 0.8 of my fee before a client. And I'm using the address 203.0.113.1.
which is my server's IP address, which is being translated to this other IP over here. You will see here that it took the IP 203.0 but 113.8, it was translated into hexadecimal. So Jules shows us hexadecimal, but we know that this is an IPv4 address contained in an IPv6. So if do a ping test using my other clients, you will have three sessions, one session for each of my clients that interact there. That is why we created this topology with three different clients to see the interaction with three clients. So. I look at clients two and three, and we'll do a ping test with these two. In this case, it used a parameter for four packets. It's a C4. In the jewel, we once again display the sessions, and you will note that we have three sessions now. We have my client session that ends in A, which is client number three, A, and another one that ends in nine, and then another one ends in eight. So these sessions if I give the command once again, the value dropped because my clients only sent four packets and they stopped communicating. So Jules was there waiting for 60 seconds. And if there's no, no interaction, then the session closes. So it does not r remain there. Another client that is doing ping endlessly continues to be active because there still is interaction, but the others sort of sort of finish if there is no interaction. So all my sessions are using the same IPv4 address. Even when my server has a different mission, the drill nevertheless takes the first IPv4 it finds in the interface. So it is captive it is caught in that IP. NAT64 uses the same concept with NAT. It uses TCP IP ports. And if you put everything together in the same IP, there will come a time we will have no more ports. So it's interesting to add this so that the jewel starts selecting the IP addresses that it's going to use in order to go out to IPv4. So you so have to tell Jewel, I want you to use this, this, and this IPv4 address. This has to be specified. So I will now stop here with the ping of client one so it doesn't consume my bandwidth. So what will we do now? I'm, we're going to take these IPv4 addresses we have and going to add these to the IPv4 address, the pool four, which is the IPv4 address pool. Yeah, I entered all the TCP uh, ports, the uh, addresses, these are the ports I wish to use for this pool. These are standard ports. These are the ports that I use. You can increase the, this too. If we look over here, we have 4,000 plus ports. This is quite low because this is a gamer over here that has 4,000 ports and it, it doesn't do very much because it doesn't last so much. So one of the recommendations in the Jewel site, I left the link over here, is that the ephemeral ports of Linux should be used, which go from 32,000 to 61,000. So you put that in tool and you manage to increase and reduce the size of ports. I also added each of the IPv4s, one, two, and three. Um, 
I repeated them. You can put a range. If you put a slash 30, it would take 0, 1, 2, and 3. There would be no need to enter the command several times. I'd, I'd put it here so that you will see that uh, there are two options. You select uh, each uh, IPv4 uh, one by one or at the network. If you only want to put uh, select uh, some some IPv6 in a network, you put a range and they will all be entered. It's uh, easier, shorter. So if we once again give uh, the command, you see that the sessions um, exist and you see that there is no longer interaction between my networks. I'll take these commands. I'm going to copy them and uh, throw them into my server and I click on enter. How do I know that this pool works? Well, we can. I think that I didn't include them in the PDF, but I'm going to show you how it's done. Instead of ADD, let's put display. We copy this uh, whole set and it shows Joule, Lucknick 40, pool 4, display, and it shows my IPv4 pool. I have my pool here with the three addresses, and the ports have been configured for these addresses. Here I also have mark. This is a way I can segment by default. It puts a zero, but it could pull another IPv4 pool with a mark one, and I w well you you would have to use mark one instead of using the same pool for all the instances, the same IPv4 pool. So we can select the pool we want to use. Let's see whether Jewel will take those IPs. It's going to see my I'm my clients and I'm I'm going to ask them to ping again the addresses and let's see the sections to see what IPs have been selected. I'm going to put here a limitator so I won't have a, an endless ping and in Joule we're going to see what the ses sessions look like now. So now let's take a look at this. I have three sessions. The three sessions have took uh, the IPv4 address. And the other three sessions took three. Joule has an algorithm that selects what IPs to use. If I stopped this session and I ping again, then Joel would take a different session. Sometimes it takes one, two, three, four different sessions that will all depend on uh, the availability of IP addresses if there are many IP clients. And so I can optimize the use of my IPv4 addresses since it will select the IP addresses that will be used. Now, going back to our tutorial, a PDF is requesting to perform the ping test again, and we see that the ping displayed is uh, the by information. Uh, uh, this is a summarized part way of what IPs are being used uh, at a certain time and which are tethered to them. Let me show you. Now you won't see anything because I don't have a session here. Let wait until I have a new ping to create new session. Now I do. So this is a spreadsheet that Joel creates to see what IPv6 address is linked to what IPv4 address. So I have my address 1 used by two clients and address 3 by 
another client. And now my address too has been left out. So it's always going to cha change depending on our sessions. So here you have a summary where you can give all the information about the session. Now let's look at the next part of the tutorial. This is important. I told you that uh, the ICMP session lasts 60 seconds. However, that can be changed if you use this global update uh, command uh, and uh, you put uh, the time. If you put global update ICMP timeout, you can put, for instance, 0002. Uh, a zero zero, and it will understand that the session is now expected to last longer. I think that 60 seconds is too little. The, so I prolong it. Instead of one minute, it now takes two minutes. So because if not, they will be falling all the time, clashing all the time. So if we implement the timeout of these protocols, it will last longer. I will give you the um, and I give you this example, but the rest of the protocols work in the, just the same. Now, in this part, we're going to activate the logs, because it's stateful. So it generates uh, data and uh, it uh, creates logs. But by default, these laws are disabled. So if we want to do monitoring or troubleshooting, if the session uh, has been closed, then the uh, data is no longer there. So we're going to activate the log. So we go to global. Those are the uh, configurations of the instance, and we are going to use this command, the global update logging bib, for it to save the binding information, base information, and I also want it to keep the logs of my session. So I use these two commands, and I'm going to change to true. Why? Let me show you so that it you'll understand it better. So what uh, data can I change in the global part of Joule? If you look at this, let me clean this a bit. I have several options. In the class part, drop ICMP version 6, uh, and then uh, the update timeout, ICMP timeout. Uh, and I have these two options for logging that comes, comes false. To activate them, I need to put true at the end so that it will start generating the logs of my sessions. It's important to highlight the following. If we activate these logs with uh, sessions that are already active, they won't appear in the log. That is, you have to close them and to start uh, the sessions all over again so that this can be inserted. So I activate it. I generate traffic again. with my client's bib. And the good thing about this is that once you activate these options, uh, dual uh, logs, you will have this, so for instance, uh, this uh, CTL that uh, replaces these logs. So you can send this information somewhere else. And let's use journal CTL minus F to see what logs were generated for us. It didn't copy it. Wait a minute. I'm going to enter it manually. Look at this. If we look at what did it keep of the logs for us, first of all, whenever there's a new session here, 
and the session. It puts the IPv6 address that is linked to it, the IP, the output, the outbound uh, IPv6 uh, session, the IPv4 session, and it shows the time the session started and the IP that was mapped. That is uh, the session that uh, was started. And when the session uh, is completed, it goes the other way around. The session is where it says forgot, that's the end of the session. If here, if we are speaking of providers and you need to keep these logs to know when the IPs were used, then you can see when the session was uh, completed, when it started, what IPv4 used, what IPv6. By default, it doesn't show it, so we have to activate dual sessions. Now, there's another type of log that is for debugging and it brings much more detailed information so if there are any problems if you want to know what happens with the translation process you can also activate that debug log now as we need the bib for the sessions this is the one that we wanted to focus on now here there's an observation it says a, a remark that says that the logs are only uh, in the sessions that have uh, get started only when the session has been activated. Please don't forget that. And here we have the final part. All we did, if I restart the server now, I lose it because it's not uh, being saved uh, permanently, but I can configure it so that despite a reboot, uh, it may continue to, to show. So how do I do that? Well, uh, the... I, I can uh, save this uh, in JSON files. Here we I have the examples Joule conf and Joule sit conf. One is not 64 and the other one is sit. And it shows the parameters that can be used. And in our repository here in the tutorial, I have the configuration file that we uh, uh, did for this tutorial. I'm going to zoom it. And here you see this is a standard uh, JSON file. Here we have, um, and here the instance, the pool that I want, uh, what pool of IPv6 I want to use. I can also configure my logs to be generated. I pull my IPv4 pool here, and this is what we did, but uh, in a single file. And even for a better management to update the jewel, it's easier than doing it manually each time you restart the server. So let us restart the server. So let me reboot over here. And let us wait until it reboots. So I will log in once again. And here we put Joule instance display. And we will realize that the session we had no longer exists. So the module is disabled. And our Joule is as if we had finished installing it, which is what we're going to do now. So let us enable the Joule module once again. It's the same steps that we followed when we started with this tutorial. You can also use this file over here. We can put Joule and then automatically it will enable the Joule module. And the packet forwarding can also be done using the sysctl conf in the case of Debian. If you're using a different Linux distribution, please check how this permanent enabling of the forwarding is done. So I will activate it once again. So what are we going to do now? We're going to create a directory called Joule. 
And this is where we're going to put the JSON jewel file. So let's put MKD slash etc slash jewel. And now let's enter this directory. And for the purpose of this tutorial, we prepared a JSON file that you can also download. This is the same file. If you wish to copy it from over here, you can also do so. But it is also available here in an easier way in wget. So I'm going to copy it to my server. Here it downloaded it. So let us have a look at the contents of this file. cat tool.conf and here you have all the configurations we did in the JSON format. And for those of you who work for JSON, this is nothing new. But if you never worked for JSON, with JSON, pay attention to the commas. Some people sort of get confused. You can put the JSON file and sometimes it solves this and removes the commas that are not necessary. But there are other things that are not necessary. So it takes these out. So any space, additional space might generate problems when using it. So we download the drool file. We put that in the directory. And we then rebooted, restarted the drool service, which will then take the information of the file automatically and then apply it to the server. So we're going to use this system CTL start jewel. If the instance jewel instance display created this instance, like Nick 40. And if we use the other commands that we used previously, I'm going to take the ICMP pool. We can see here that I created my pool with the IPv4 addresses. So now, if we look at the IPv6 clients, I do ping, and this will work. And if I go to the other client and I use ping, this was also successful over here. And in the case of the third client, it also worked. So if we here display the ICMP session, it also generated the three sessions. So all the configuration we did is summarized in one single file, and we managed to enter it to a version control for the purpose of automation. So that's the best thing instead of doing everything by hand. So I here I have address one and address two. So it's not that this is not a case where we used one, two, and three, but sometimes that is a case. If you wish to update anything on Joule, you enter the file that you just downloaded, you edit the file, or you add an object to that file, to that JSON file, and it do restart Joule like any other Linux option, and you just change the contents of that file, and then this is applied automatically. So this was regarding NAT64. Hopefully, the next time will be with less inconveniences. I apologize for the issues we had when we started off. These things sometimes happen, and here the references, the webinar we organize with, like Nick, it's available in English. Spanish and Portuguese, the two web uh, seminars, and the, the road towards IPv6 only networks, the two RFCs, the one on NAT64, and the official dual site. It contains tutorials, 
It contains the full documentation. And one of the things that should be highlighted is that there is another dual site that is dual.mx, which is not updated. They themselves mentioned that there is, that site isn't being isn't updated. So pay attention to which site you access. So let, shall we have a break now? All right. So thank you very much once again. Thank you for your attention. So this lab isn't, hasn't finished yet. We have more experiences, but this is coffee break time. So we'll have the break now, and we will then resume with two further laboratories. Now, before that, let me make an announcement. The group number that you received, please keep that, because this is something that you will be using for the next experiences. When we speak about SAIT and the proxy and so on, you'll be using the same group. Take note of that group, the group we sent you, so you can then log in using that name and then make your experience with that. Yes, the group name, you have to maintain that. There are some people who are online and I'm paying attention to Sul. So, so if you need anything, please let me know. After the break, we'll have two further laboratories which are very important the one on SIT and the one on proxy. So don't miss those. We have a 30 minute break. So please come back on time. And let me tell you that there will be a presentation during the break from one of our sponsors, Ascenti. So we we'll resume after the break with the tutorial on the path to the future. IPv6 only networks. Mm -hmm.